Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. Of Mice and Men. By John Steinbeck. Chapter 3. Although there was evening brightness showing through the windows of the bunkhouse, inside it was dusk. Through the open door came the thuds and occasional clangs of a horseshoe game, and now and then the sound of voices raised in approval or derision. Slim and George came into the darkening bunkhouse together. Slim reached up over the card table and turned on the tin-shaded electric light. Instantly the table was brilliant with light, and the cone of the shade threw its brightness straight downward, leaving the corners of the bunkhouse still in dusk. Slim sat down on a box and George took his place opposite. It wasn't nothing, said Slim. I would have had to drown most of them anyways. No need to thank me about that. George said, it wasn't much to you, maybe, but it was a hell of a lot to him. Jesus Christ, I don't know how we're gonna get him to sleep in here. He'll want to sleep right out in the barn with them. We'll have trouble keeping him from getting right in the box with them pups. It wasn't nothing, Slim repeated. Say, you sure was right about him. Maybe he ain't bright but I never seen such a worker. He damn near killed his partner Buckin Barley. There ain't nobody can keep up with him. God Almighty, I never seen such a strong guy. George spoke proudly. Just tell Lenny what to do and he'll do it if it don't take no figuring. He can't think of nothing to do himself, but he sure can take orders. There was a clang of horseshoe on iron stake outside and a little cheer of voices. Slim moved back slightly so the light was not on his face. Funny how you and him string along together. It was Slim's calm invitation to confidence. What's funny about it? George demanded defensively. Oh, I dunno. Hardly none of the guys ever travel together. I hardly never seen two guys travel together. You know how the hands are, they just come in and get their bunk and work a month, and then they quit and go out alone. Never seem to give a damn about nobody. It just seems kinda of funny a cuckoo like him and a smart little guy like you travelin' together. He ain't no cuckoo, said George. He's dumb as hell, but he ain't crazy. And I ain't so bright neither, or I wouldn't be buckin' barley for my fifty and found. If I was bright, if I was even a little bit smart, I'd have my own little place, and, I'd be bringin', in my own crops, stead of doin' all the work and not getting what comes up out of the ground. George fell silent. He wanted to talk. Slim neither encouraged nor discouraged him. He just sat back quiet and receptive. It ain't so funny, him and me goin' around, together, George said at last. Him and me was both born in Auburn. I knowed his Aunt Clara. She took him when he was a baby and raised him up. When his Aunt Clara died, Lenny just come along with me out workin'. Got kinda used to each other after a little while. Um, said Slim. George looked over at Slim and saw the calm, godlike eyes fastened on him. Funny, said George. I used to have a hell of a lot of fun with him. Used to play jokes on him cause he was too dumb to take care of himself but he was too dumb even to know he had a joke played on him. I had fun. Made me seem goddamn smart alongside of him. Why he do any damn thing I told him. If I told him to walk over a cliff, over he'd go. That wasn't so damn much fun after a while. He never got mad about it, neither. I've beat the hell out of him, and he coulda bust every bone in my body just with his hands, but he never lifted a finger against me. George's voice was taking on the tone of confession. Tell you what made me stop that. One day a bunch of guys was standin' around up on the Sacramento River. I was feelin' pretty smart. I turns to Lenny and says, jump in. And he jumps. Couldn't swim a stroke. He damn near drowned before we could get him. And he was so damn nice to me for pullin' him out. 
Clean forgot I told him to jump in. Well, I ain't done nothing like that no more. He's a nice fella, said Slim. Guy don't need no sense to be a nice fella. Seems to me sometimes it just works the other way around. Take a real smart guy and he ain't hardly ever a nice fella. George stacked the scattered cards and began to lay out his solitaire hand. The shoes thudded on the ground outside. At the windows the light of the evening still made the window squares bright. I ain't got no people, George said. I seen the guys that go around on the ranches alone. That ain't no good. They don't have no fun. After a long time they get mean. They get wanton to fight all the time. Yeah, they get mean, Slim agreed. They get so they don't want to talk to nobody. Course Lenny's a goddamn nuisance most of the time, said George. But you get used to going around with a guy and you can't get rid of him. He ain't mean, said Slim. I can see Lenny ain't a bit mean. Course he ain't mean. But he gets in trouble all the time because he's so goddamn dumb. Like what happened in we dash, he stopped, stopped in the middle of turning over a card. He looked alarmed and peered over at Slim. You wouldn't tell nobody. What did he do in weed? Slim asked calmly. You wouldn't tell? No, course you wouldn't, dot. What did he do in weed? Slim asked again. Well, he seen this girl in a red dress. Dumb bastard like he is, he wants to touch everything he likes. Just wants to feel it. So he reaches out to feel this red dress and the girl lets out a squawk, and that gets Lenny all mixed up, and he holds on, cause that's the only thing he can think to do. Well, this girl squawks and squawks. I was just a little bit off, and I heard all the yelling, so I comes running, and by that time Lenny's so scared all he can think to do is just hold on. I socked him over the head with a fence picket to make him let go. He was so scared he couldn't let go of that dress. And he's so goddamn strong, you know. Slim's eyes were level and unwinking. He nodded very slowly. So what happens? George carefully built his line of solitaire cards. Well, that girl rabbits in and tells the law she been raped. The guys and we'd start a party out to lynch Lenny. So we sit in a irrigation ditch under water all the rest of that day. Got Ani our head sticking out of water, and up under the grass that sticks out from the side of the ditch. And that night we scrammed out of there. Slim sat in silence for a moment. Didn't hurt the girl none, huh? He asked finally. Hell, no. He just scared her. I'd be scared too if he grabbed me. But he never hurt her. He just wanted to touch that red dress, like he wants to pet them pups all the time. He ain't mean, said Slim. I can tell a mean guy a mile off. Course he ain't, and he'll do any damn thing I dash, Lenny came in through the door. He wore his blue denim coat over his shoulders like a cape, and he walked hunched way over. Hi, Lenny, said George. How you like the pup now? Lenny said breathlessly, he's brown and white just like I wanted. He went directly to his bunk and lay down and turned his face to the wall and drew up his knees. George put down his cards very deliberately. Lenny, he said sharply. Lenny twisted his neck and looked over his shoulder. Huh? What you want, George? I told you you couldn't bring that pup in here. What pup, George? I ain't got no pup. George went quickly to him, grabbed him by the shoulder and rolled him over. He reached down and picked the tiny puppy from where Lenny had been concealing it against his stomach. Lenny sat up quickly. Give um to me, George. George said, you get right up and take this pup back to the nest. He's gotta sleep with his mother. You want to kill him? Just born last night and you take him out of the nest. You take him back or I'll tell Slim not to let you have him. Lenny held out his hands pleadingly. Give um to me, George. I'll take um back. 
I didn't mean no harm, George. Honest I didn't. I just wanted to pet, um a little. George handed the pup to him. All right. You get him back there quick, and don't you take him out no more. You'll kill him, the first thing you know. Lenny fairly scuttled out of the room. Slim had not moved. His calm eyes followed Lenny out the door. Jesus, he said. He's just like a kid, ain't he? Sure he's just like a kid. There ain't no more harm in him than a kid neither, except he's so strong. I bet he won't come in here to sleep tonight. He'd sleep right alongside that box in the barn. Well, let him. He ain't doing no harm out there. It was almost dark outside now. Old Candy, the swamper, came in and went to his bunk, and behind him struggled his old dog. Hello, Slim. Hello, George. Didn't neither of you play horseshoes? I don't like to play ever tonight, said Slim. Candy went on, either you guys got a slug of whiskey? I got a gut ache. I ain't, said Slim. I'd drink it myself if I had, and I ain't got a gut ache neither. Got a bad gut ache, said Candy. Them goddamn turnips give it to me. I knowed they was going to before I ever eat em. The thick-bodied Carlson came in out of the darkening yard. He walked to the other end of the bunkhouse and turned on the second shaded light. Darker and hell in here, he said. Jesus, how that nigger can pitch shoes. He's plenty good, said Slim. Damn right he is, said Carlson. He don't give nobody else a chance to win Dash, he stopped and sniffed the air, and still sniffing, looked down at the old dog. God almighty, that dog stinks. Get him out of here, Candy. I don't know nothing that stinks as bad as an old dog. You gotta get him out. Candy rolled to the edge of his bunk. He reached over and patted the ancient dog, and he apologized, I've been around him so much I never notice how he stinks. Well, I can't stand him in here, said Carlson. That stink hangs around even after he's gone. He walked over with his heavy-legged stride and looked down at the dog. Got no teeth, he said. He's all stiff with rheumatism. He ain't no good to you, Candy. And he ain't no good to himself. Why ain't you shoot him, Candy? The old man squirmed uncomfortably. Well, hell. I had him so long. Had him since he was a pup. I herded sheep with him. He said proudly, you wouldn't think it to look at him now, but he was the best damn sheep dog I ever seen. George said, I seen a guy in weed that had an Airedale could herd sheep. Learned it from the other dogs. Carlson was not to be put off. Look, Candy. This old dog just suffers hisself all the time. If you was to take him out and shoot him right in the back of the head dash, he leaned over and pointed, right there, why he'd never know what hit him. Candy looked about unhappily. No, he said softly. No, I couldn't do that. I had him too long. He don't have no fun, Carlson insisted. And he stinks to beat hell. Tell you what. I'll shoot him for you. Then it won't be you that does it. Candy threw his legs off his bunk. He scratched the white stubble whiskers on his cheek nervously. I'm so used to him, he said softly. I had him from a pup. Well, you ain't be in kind to him keepin him alive, said Carlson. Look, Slim's bitch got a litter right now. I bet Slim would give you one of them pups to raise up, wouldn't you, Slim? The Skinner had been studying the old dog with his calm eyes. Yeah, he said. You can have a pup if you want to. He seemed to shake himself free for speech. Carl's right, Candy. That dog ain't no good to himself. I wished somebody'd shoot me if I get old and a cripple. Candy looked helplessly at him, for Slim's opinions were law. Maybe it'd hurt him, he suggested. I don't mind Takin, care of him. 
Carlson said, the way I'd shoot him, he wouldn't feel nothing. I'd put the gun right there. He pointed with his toe. Right back of the head. He wouldn't even quiver. Candy looked for help from face to face. It was quite dark outside by now. A young laboring man came in. His sloping shoulders were bent forward and he walked heavily on his heels, as though he carried the invisible grain bag. He went to his bunk and put his hat on his shelf. Then he picked a pulp magazine from his shelf and brought it to the light over the table. Did I show you this, Slim? he asked. Show me what? The young man turned to the back of the magazine, put it down on the table and pointed with his finger. Right there, read that. Slim bent over it. Go on, said the young man. Read it out loud. Dear editor, Slim read slowly. I read your mag for six years and I think it is the best on the market. I like stories by Peter Rand. I think he is a wingding. Give us more like the Dark Rider. I don't write many letters. Just thought I would tell you I think your mag is the best dimes worth I ever spent. Slim looked up questioningly. What do you want me to read that for? Wit said, go on. Read the name at the bottom. Slim read, yours for success, William Tenor. He glanced up at Wit again. What do you want me to read that for? Wit closed the magazine impressively. Don't you remember Bill Tenor? Worked here about three months ago? Slim thought. Little guy, he asked. Drove a cultivator? That's him, Wit cried. That's the guy. You think he's the guy wrote this letter? I know it. Bill and me was in here one day. Bill had one of them books that just come. He was looking, in it and he says, I wrote a letter. Wonder if they put it in the book. But it wasn't there. Bill says, maybe they're Savon, it for later. And that's just what they done. There it is. Guess you're right, said Slim. Got it right in the book. George held out his hand for the magazine. Let's look at it. Wit found the place again, but he did not surrender his hold on it. He pointed out the letter with his forefinger. And then he went to his box shelf and laid the magazine carefully in. I wonder if Bill seen it, he said. Bill and me worked in that patch of field peas. Run cultivators, both of us. Bill was a hell of a nice fella. During the conversation Carlson had refused to be drawn in. He continued to look down at the old dog. Candy watched him uneasily. At last Carlson said, if you want me to, I'll put the old devil out of his misery right now and get it over with. Ain't nothing left for him. Can't eat, can't see, can't even walk without Hutton, dot. Candy said hopefully, you ain't got no gun. The hell I ain't got a luger. It won't hurt him none at all. Candy said, maybe tomorrow. Lee's wait till tomorrow. I don't see no reason for it, said Carlson. He went to his bunk, pulled his bag from underneath it and took out a luger pistol. Lee's get it over with, he said. We can't sleep with him stinking around in here. He put the pistol in his hip pocket. Candy looked a long time at Slim to try to find some reversal. And Slim gave him none. At last Candy said softly and hopelessly, a right, take, I'm. He did not look down at the dog at all. He lay back on his bunk and crossed his arms behind his head and stared at the ceiling. From his pocket Carlson took a little leather thong. He stooped over and tied it around the old dog's neck. All the men except Candy watched him. Come boy. Come on, boy, he said gently. And he said apologetically to Candy, he won't even feel it. Candy did not move nor answer him. He twitched the thong. Come on, boy. The old dog got slowly and stiffly to his feet and followed the gently pulling leash. Slim said, Carlson. Yeah. You know what to do. 
What you mean, Slim? Take a shovel, said Slim shortly. Oh, sure. I get you. He led the dog out into the darkness. George followed to the door and shut the door and set the latch gently in its place. Candy lay rigidly on his bed staring at the ceiling. Slim said loudly, one of my lead mules got a bad hoof. Got to get some tar on it. His voice trailed off. It was silent outside. Carlson's footsteps died away. The silence came into the room. And the silence lasted. George chuckled, I bet Lenny's right out there in the barn with his pup. He won't want to come in here no more now he's got a pup. Slim said, Candy, you can have any one of them pups you want. Candy did not answer. The silence fell on the room again. It came out of the night and invaded the room. George said, Anybody like to play a little euchre? I'll play out a few with you, said Wit. They took places opposite each other at the table under the light, but George did not shuffle the cards. He rippled the edge of the deck nervously, and the little snapping noise drew the eyes of all the men in the room, so that he stopped doing it. The silence fell on the room again. A minute passed, and another minute. Candy lay still, staring at the ceiling. Slim gazed at him for a moment and then looked down at his hands, he subdued one hand with the other, and held it down. There came a little gnawing sound from under the floor and all the men looked down toward it gratefully. Only Candy continued to stare at the ceiling. Sounds like there was a rat under there, said George. We ought to get a trap down there. Wit broke out, what the hell's Takin him so long? Lay out some cards, why don't you? We ain't going to get no euchre played this way. George brought the cards together tightly and studied the backs of them. The silence was in the room again. A shot sounded in the distance. The men looked quickly at the old man. Every head turned toward him. For a moment he continued to stare at the ceiling. Then he rolled slowly over and faced the wall and lay silent. George shuffled the cards noisily and dealt them. Wit drew a scoring board to him and set the pegs to start. Wit said, I guess you guys really come here to work. How do you mean? George asked. Wit laughed. Well, you come on a Friday. You got two days to work till Sunday. I don't see how you figure, said George. Wit laughed again. You do if you been around these big ranches much. Guy that wants to look over a ranch comes in Saturday afternoon. He gets Saturday night supper and three meals on Sunday, and he can quit Monday morning after breakfast without turning his hand. But you come to work Friday noon. You got to put in a day and a half no matter how you figure. George looked at him levelly. We're gonna stick around a while, he said. Me and Lenny's gonna roll up a stake. The door opened quietly and the stable buck put in his head, a lean negro head, lined with pain, the eyes patient. Mr. Slim. Slim took his eyes from old candy. Huh. Oh. Hello, crooks. What's a matter? You told me to warm up tar for that mule's foot. I got it warm. Oh. Sure, crooks. I'll come right out and put it on. I can do it if you want, Mr. Slim. No. I'll come do it myself. He stood up. Crook said, Mr. Slim. Yeah. That big new guy's messin' around your pups out in the barn. Well, he ain't doin' no harm. I give him one of them pups. Just thought I'd tell ya, said Crooks. He's talking em out of the nest and handlin' them. That won't do them no good. He won't hurt em, said Slim. I'll come along with you now. George looked up. If that crazy bastard's foolin' around too much, just kick him out, Slim. Slim followed the stable buck out of the room. George dealt and Wit picked up his cards and examined them. Seen the new kid yet? he asked. 
What kid? George asked. Why, Curly's new wife. Yeah, I seen her. Well, ain't she a Lulu? I ain't seen that much of her, said George. Whit laid down his cards impressively. Well, stick around and keep your eyes open. You'll see plenty. She ain't concealin' nothing. I never seen nobody like her. She got the eye goin' all the time on everybody. I bet she even gives the stable buck the eye. I don't know what the hell she wants. George asked casually, been any trouble since she got here? It was obvious that Wit was not interested in his cards. He laid his hand down and George scooped it in. George laid out his deliberate solitaire hand, seven cards, and six on top, and five on top of those. Wit said, I see what you mean. No, they ain't been nothing yet. Curly's got yellow jackets in his drawers, but that's all so far. Ever, time the guys is around she shows up. She's looking for Curly, or she thought she left something laying around and she's looking for it. Seems like she can't keep away from guys. And, Curly's pants is just crawlin' with ants, but they ain't nothing come of it yet. George said, she's gonna make a mess. They's gonna be a bad mess about her. She's a jailbait all set on the trigger. That Curly got his work cut out for him. Ranch with a bunch of guys on it ain't no place for a girl, specially like her. Wit said, if you got IDARs, you ought to come in town with us guys tomorrow night. Why? What's doing? Just the usual thing. We go into old Susie's place. Hell of a nice place. Old Susie's a laugh, always crackin' jokes. Like she says when we come up on the front porch last Saturday night. Susie opens the door and then she yells over her shoulder, Get your coats on, girls, here comes the sheriff. She never talks dirty, neither. Got five girls there. What's it set you back? George asked. Two and a half. You can get a shot for two bits. Susie got nice chairs to set in, too. If a guy don't want a flop, why he can just sit in the chairs and have a couple or three shots and pass the time of day and Susie don't give a damn. She ain't rushin' guys through and kickin' em out if they don't want a flop. Might go in and look the joint over, said George. Sure. Come along. It's a hell of a lot of fun, her crackin' jokes all the time. Like she says one time, she says, I've knew people that if they got a rag rug on the floor and a cupid doll lamp on the phonograph they think they're running a parlor house. That's Clara's house she's talking about. And Susie says, I know what you boys want, she says. My girls is clean, she says, and there ain't no water in my whiskey, she says. If any you guys want to look at a cupid doll lamp and take your own chance getting burned, why you know where to go. And, she says, there's guys around here walkin', bow-legged, cause they like to look at a QP doll lamp. George asked, Clara runs the other house, huh? Yeah, said Wit. We don't never go there. Clara gets three bucks a crack and thirty-five cents a shot, and she don't crack no jokes. But Susie's place is clean and she got nice chairs. Don't let no goo-goos in, neither. Me and Lenny's rollin' up a stake, said George. I might go in and set and have a shot, but I ain't puttin' out no two and a half. Well, a guy got to have some fun sometime, said Wit. The door opened and Lenny and Carlson came in together. Lenny crept to his bunk and sat down, trying not to attract attention. Carlson reached under his bunk and brought out his bag. He didn't look at old Candy, who still faced the wall. Carlson found a little cleaning rod in the bag and a can of oil. He laid them on his bed and then brought out the pistol, took out the magazine and snapped the loaded shell from the chamber. Then he fell to cleaning the barrel with the little rod. When the ejector snapped, Candy turned over and looked for a moment at the gun before he turned back to the wall again. Carlson said casually, 
Curly been in yet? No, said Wit. What's eaten on Curly? Carlson squinted down the barrel of his gun. Lookin' for his old lady. I seen him going round and round outside. Wit said sarcastically, he spends half his time looking for her, and the rest of the time she's looking for him. Curly burst into the room excitedly. Any you guys seen my wife, he demanded. She ain't been here, said Wit. Curly looked threateningly about the room. Where the hell slim? Went out in the barn, said George. He was gonna put some tar on a split hoof. Curly's shoulders dropped and squared. How long ago'd he go? Five, ten minutes. Curly jumped out the door and banged it after him. Wit stood up. I guess maybe I'd like to see this, he said. Curly's just spoilin' or he wouldn't start for Slim. And, Curly's handy, goddamn handy. Got in the finals for the Golden Gloves. He got newspaper clippings about it. He considered. But just the same, he better leave Slim alone. Nobody don't know what Slim can do. Think Slim's with his wife, don't he, said George. Looks like it, Wit said. Course Slim ain't. Least I don't think Slim is. But I like to see the fuss if it comes off. Come on, Lee's go. George said, I'm staying right here. I don't want to get mixed up in nothing. Lenny and me got to make a steak. Carlson finished the cleaning of the gun and put it in the bag and pushed the bag under his bunk. I guess I'll go out and look her over, he said. Old Candy lay still, and Lenny, from his bunk, watched George cautiously. When Witt and Carlson were gone and the door closed after them, George turned to Lenny. What you got on your mind? I ain't done nothing, George. Slim says I better not pet them pups so much for a while. Slim says it ain't good for them, so I come right in. I been good, George. I coulda told you that, said George. Well, I wasn't hudden em none. I just had mine in my lap pet tin it. George asked, did you see Slim out in the barn? Sure I did. He told me I better not pet that pup no more. Did you see that girl? You mean Curly's girl? Yeah. Did she come in the barn? No. Anyways I never seen her. You never seen Slim talking to her? Uh uh. She ain't been in the barn. Okay, said George. I guess them guys ain't gonna see no fight. If there's any fightin', Lenny, you keep out of it. I don't want no fights, said Lenny. He got up from his bunk and sat down at the table, across from George. Almost automatically George shuffled the cards and laid out his solitaire hand. He used a deliberate, thoughtful slowness. Lenny reached for a face card and studied it, then turned it upside down and studied it. Both ends the same, he said. George, why is it both ends the same? I don't know, said George. That's just the way they make M. What was Slim doing in the barn when you seen him? Slim? Sure. You seen him in the barn, and he told you not to pet the pups so much. Oh, yeah. He had a can of tar and a paintbrush. I don't know what for. You sure that girl didn't come in like she come in here today? No. She never come. George sighed. You give me a good whorehouse every time, he said. A guy can go in and get drunk and get everything out of his system all at once, and no messes. And he knows how much it's gonna set him back. These here jail baits is just set on the trigger of the huskow. Lenny followed his words admiringly, and moved his lips a little to keep up. George continued, you remember Andy Cushman, Lenny? Went to grammar school. The one that his old lady used to make hot cakes for the kids? Lenny asked. Yeah. That's the one. You can remember anything if there's anything to eat in it. George looked carefully at the solitaire hand. 
He put an ace up on his scoring rack and piled a two, three, and four of diamonds on it. Andy's in San Quentin right now on account of a tart, said George. Lenny drummed on the table with his fingers. George? Huh? George, how long's it gonna be till we get that little place and live on the fat of the lawn and rabbits? I don't know, said George. We gotta get a big steak together. I know a little place we can get cheap, but they ain't given it away. Old Candy turned slowly over. His eyes were wide open. He watched George carefully. Lenny said, tell about that place, George. I just told you, just last night. Go on, tell again, George. Well, it's ten acres, said George. Got a little windmill. Got a little shack on it, and a chicken run. Got a kitchen, orchard, cherries, apples, peaches, cots, nuts, got a few berries. They's a place for alfalfa and plenty water to flood it. They's a pig pen dash and rabbits, George. No place for rabbits now, but I could easy build a few hutches and you could feed alfalfa to the rabbits. Damn right, I could, said Lenny. You god damn right I could. George's hands stopped working with the cards. His voice was growing warmer. And we could have a few pigs. I could build a smokehouse like the one grandpa had, and when we kill a pig we can smoke the bacon and the hams, and make sausage and all like that. And when the salmon run up river we could catch a hundred of em and salt em down or smoke em. We could have them for breakfast. They ain't nothing so nice as smoked salmon. When the fruit come in we could can it, and tomatoes, they're easy to can. Ever Sunday we'd kill a chicken or a rabbit. Maybe we'd have a cow or a goat, and the cream is so goddamn thick you got to cut it with a knife and take it out with a spoon. Lenny watched him with wide eyes, and Old Candy watched him too. Lenny said softly, we could live off of the fat of the lawn, dot. Sure, said George. All kinds of vegetables in the garden, and if we want a little whiskey we can sell a few eggs or something, or some milk. We'd just live there. We'd belong there. There wouldn't be no more running round the country and gettin' fed by a Jap cook. No, sir, we'd have our own place where we belonged and not sleep in no bunkhouse. Tell about the house, George, Lenny begged. Sure, we'd have a little house and a room to ourself. Little fat iron stove, and in the winter we'd keep a fire goin' in it. It ain't enough land so we'd have to work too hard. Maybe six, seven hours a day. We wouldn't have to buck no barley eleven hours a day. And when we put in a crop, why, we'd be there to take the crop up. We'd know what come of our planting. And rabbits, Lenny said eagerly. And I'd take care of em. Tell how I'd do that, George. Sure, you'd go out in the alfalfa patch and you'd have a sack. You'd fill up the sack and bring it in and put it in the rabbit cages. They'd nibble and they'd nibble, said Lenny, the way they do. I seen em. Ever six weeks or so, George continued, them does would throw a litter so we'd have plenty rabbits to eat and to sell. And we'd keep a few pigeons to go flying around the windmill like they done when I was a kid. He looked raptly at the wall over Lenny's head. And it'd be our own, and nobody could can us. If we don't like a guy we can say, get the hell out, and by God he's got to do it. And if a friend come along, why we'd have an extra bunk, and we'd say, why don't you spend the night, and by God he would. We'd have a setter dog and a couple striped cats, but you gotta watch out them cats don't get the little rabbits. Lenny breathed hard. You just let em try to get the rabbits. I'll break their goddamn necks. I'll. I'll smash em with a stick. He subsided, grumbling to himself, threatening the future cats which might dare to disturb the future rabbits. George sat entranced with his own picture. 
When Candy spoke they both jumped as though they had been caught doing something reprehensible. Candy said, you know where's a place like that? George was on guard immediately. Spose I do, he said. What's that to you? You don't need to tell me where it's at. Might be any place. Sure, said George. That's right. You couldn't find it in a hundred years. Candy went on excitedly, how much they want for a place like that. George watched him suspiciously. Well, I could get it for six hundred bucks. The old people that owns it is flat bust and the old lady needs an operation. Say, what's it to you? You got nothing to do with us. Candy said, I ain't much good with Ani one hand. I lost my hand right here on this ranch. That's why they give me a job swampin. And they give me two hundred and fifty dollars cause I lose my hand. And I got fifty more saved up right in the bank right now. There's three hundred and I got fifty more comin the end of the month. Tell you what dash he leaned forward eagerly. Spose I went in with you guys. There's three hundred and fifty bucks I'd put in. I ain't much good, but I could cook and tend the chickens and hoe the garden some. How'd that be? George half closed his eyes. I gotta think about that. We was always gonna do it by ourselves. Candy interrupted him, I'd make a will and leave my share to you guys in case I kick off, cause I ain't got no relatives nor nothing. You guys got any money? Maybe we could do her right now? George spat on the floor disgustedly. We got ten bucks between us. Then he said thoughtfully, look, if me and Lenny work a month and don't spend nothing, we'll have a hundred bucks. That'd be four fifty. I bet we could swing her for that. Then you and Lenny could go get her started and I'd get a job and make up the res, and you could sell eggs and stuff like that. They fell into a silence. They looked at one another, amazed. This thing they had never really believed in was coming true. George said reverently, Jesus Christ. I bet we could swing her. His eyes were full of wonder. I bet we could swing her, he repeated softly. Candy sat on the edge of his bunk. He scratched the stump of his wrist nervously. I got hurt four year ago, he said. They'll can me putty soon. Just as soon as I can't swamp out no bunkhouses they'll put me on the county. Maybe if I give you guys my money, you'll let me hoe in the garden even after I ain't no good at it. And I'll wash dishes and little chicken stuff like that. But I'll be on our own place and I'll be let to work on our own place. He said miserably, you seen what they done to my dog tonight? They says he wasn't no good to himself nor nobody else. When they can me here I wished somebody'd shoot me. But they won't do nothing like that. I won't have no place to go, and I can't get no more jobs. I'll have thirty dollars more coming, time you guys is ready to quit. George stood up. We'll do her, he said. We'll fix up that little old place and we'll go live there. He sat down again. They all sat still, all bemused by the beauty of the thing, each mind was popped into the future when this lovely thing should come about. George said wonderingly, s'pose there was a carnival or a circus come to town, or a ball game, or any damn thing. Old Candy nodded in appreciation of the idea. We'd just go to her. George said. We wouldn't ask nobody if we could. Just say, we'll go to her, and we would. Just milk the cow and sling some grain to the chickens and go to her. And put some grass to the rabbits, Lenny broke in. I wouldn't never forget to feed them. When we gone to do it, George? In one month. Right squack in one month. Know what I'm gone to do? I'm gone to write to them old people that owns the place that will take it. And Candy'll send a hundred dollars to bind her. Sure will, said Candy. They got a good stove there. Sure, got a nice stove, burns coal or wood. I'm gonna take my pup, 
said Lenny. I bet by Christ he likes it there, by Jesus. Voices were approaching from outside. George said quickly, don't tell nobody about it. Just us three and nobody else. They leave Lee to Ken us so we can't make no stake. Just go on like we was gonna buck barley the rest of our lives, then all of a sudden someday we'll go get our pay and scram out of here. Lenny and Candy nodded, and they were grinning with delight. Don't tell nobody, Lenny said to himself. Candy said, George. Huh. I ought to have shot that dog myself, George. I shouldn't ought to have let no stranger shoot my dog. The door opened. Slim came in, followed by Curly and Carlson and Wit. Slim's hands were black with tar and he was scowling. Curly hung close to his elbow. Curly said, well, I didn't mean nothing, Slim. I just ast you. Slim said, well, you been a skin, me too often. I'm getting goddamn sick of it. If you can't look after your own goddamn wife, what you expect me to do about it? You lay off of me. I'm just trying to tell you I didn't mean nothing, said Curly. I just thought you might have saw her. Why ain't you tell her to stay the hell home where she belongs, said Carlson. You let her hang around bunkhouses and pretty soon you're gonna have some pin on your hands and you won't be able to do nothing about it. Curly whirled on Carlson. You keep out of this less you want a step outside. Carlson laughed. You goddamn punk, he said. You tried to throw a scare into Slim, and you couldn't make it stick. Slim throwed a scare into you. You're yellow as a frog belly. I don't care if you're the best welter in the country. You come for me, and I'll kick your goddamn head off. Candy joined the attack with joy. Glove full of Vaseline, he said disgustedly. Curly glared at him. His eyes slipped on past and lighted on Lenny, and Lenny was still smiling with delight at the memory of the ranch. Curly stepped over to Lenny like a terrier. What the hell you Logan at? Lenny looked blankly at him. Huh. Then Curly's rage exploded. Come on, you big bastard. Get up on your feet. No big son of a bitch is gonna laugh at me. I'll show you who's yella. Lenny looked helplessly at George, and then he got up and tried to retreat. Curly was balanced and poised. He slashed at Lenny with his left, and then smashed down his nose with a right. Lenny gave a cry of terror. Blood welled from his nose. George, he cried. Make um let me alone, George. He backed until he was against the wall, and Curly followed, slugging him in the face. Lenny's hands remained at his sides, he was too frightened to defend himself. George was on his feet yelling, get him, Lenny. Don't let him do it. Lenny covered his face with his huge paws and bleated with terror. He cried, make, um, stop, George. Then Curly attacked his stomach and cut off his wind. Slim jumped up. The dirty little rat, he cried, I'll get, um, myself. George put out his hand and grabbed Slim. Wait a minute, he shouted. He cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled, Get him, Lenny. Lenny took his hands away from his face and looked about for George, and Curly slashed at his eyes. The big face was covered with blood. George yelled again, I said get him. Curly's fist was swinging when Lenny reached for it. The next minute Curly was flopping like a fish on a line, and his closed fist was lost in Lenny's big hand. George ran down the room. Let go of him, Lenny. Let go. But Lenny watched in terror the flopping little man whom he held. Blood ran down Lenny's face, one of his eyes was cut and closed. George slapped him in the face again and again, and still Lenny held on to the closed fist. Curly was white and shrunken by now, and his struggling had become weak. He stood crying, his fist lost in Lenny's paw. 
George shouted over and over. Lego his hand, Lenny. Lego. Slim, come help me while the guy got any hand left. Suddenly Lenny let go his hold. He crouched cowering against the wall. You told me to, George, he said miserably. Curly sat down on the floor, looking in wonder at his crushed hand. Slim and Carlson bent over him. Then Slim straightened up and regarded Lenny with horror. We got to get him into a doctor, he said. Looks to me like ever, bone in his han is bust. I didn't want to, Lenny cried. I didn't want to hurt him. Slim said, Carlson, you get the candy wagon hitched up. We'll take, um, into Soledad and get, um, fixed up. Carlson hurried out. Slim turned to the whimpering Lenny. It ain't your fault, he said. This punk sure had it comin' to him. But, Jesus. He ain't hardly got no Han left. Slim hurried out, and in a moment returned with a tin cup of water. He held it to Curly's lips. George said, Slim, will we get can now? We need the steak. Will Curly's old man can us now? Slim smiled wryly. He knelt down beside Curly. You got your senses in hand enough to listen? he asked. Curly nodded. Well, then listen, Slim went on. I think you got your Han caught in a machine. If you don't tell nobody what happened, we ain't going to. But you just tell and try to get this guy canned and we'll tell everybody, and then will you get the laugh. I won't tell, said Curly. He avoided looking at Lenny. Buggy wheels sounded outside. Slim helped Curly up. Come on now. Carlson's gonna take you to a doctor. He helped Curly out the door. The sound of wheels drew away. In a moment Slim came back into the bunkhouse. He looked at Lenny, still crouched fearfully against the wall. Lee see your hands, he asked. Lenny stuck out his hands. Christ Almighty, I hate to have you mad at me, Slim said. George broke in, Lenny was just scared, he explained. He didn't know what to do. I told you nobody ought never to fight him. No, I guess it was Candy I told. Candy nodded solemnly. That's just what you done, he said. Right this morning when Curly first lit until your friend, you says, he better not fool with Lenny if he knows what's good for, um. That's just what you says to me. George turned to Lenny. It ain't your fault, he said. You don't need to be scared no more. You done just what I told you to. Maybe you better go in the washroom and clean up your face. You look like hell. Lenny smiled with his bruised mouth. I didn't want no trouble, he said. He walked toward the door, but just before he came to it, he turned back. George? What you want? I can still tend the rabbits, George. Sure. You ain't done nothing wrong. I deant mean no harm, George. Well, get the hell out and wash your face. Chapter 4 Crooks, the negro stable buck, had his bunk in the harness room, a little shed that leaned off the wall of the barn. On one side of the little room there was a square four, paned window, and on the other, a narrow plank door leading into the barn. Crook's bunk was a long box filled with straw, on which his blankets were flung. On the wall by the window there were pegs on which hung broken harness in process of being mended, strips of new leather, and under the window itself a little bench for leatherworking tools, curved knives and needles and balls of linen thread, and a small hand riveter. On pegs were also pieces of harness, a split collar with the horsehair stuffing sticking out, a broken hame, and a trace chain with its leather covering split. Crooks had his apple box over his bunk, and in it a range of medicine bottles, both for himself and for the horses. There were cans of saddle soap and a drippy can of tar with its paint brush sticking over the edge. 
and scattered about the floor were a number of personal possessions, for, being alone, Crooks could leave his things about, and being a stable buck and a cripple, he was more permanent than the other men, and he had accumulated more possessions than he could carry on his back. Crooks possessed several pairs of shoes, a pair of rubber boots, a big alarm clock and a single-barreled shotgun. And he had books, too, a tattered dictionary and a mauled copy of the California Civil Code for 1905. There were battered magazines and a few dirty books on a special shelf over his bunk. A pair of large gold-rimmed spectacles hung from a nail on the wall above his bed. This room was swept and fairly neat, for Crooks was a proud, aloof man. He kept his distance and demanded that other people keep theirs. His body was bent over to the left by his crooked spine, and his eyes lay deep in his head, and because of their depth seemed to glitter with intensity. His lean face was lined with deep black wrinkles, and he had thin, pain-tightened lips which were lighter than his face. It was Saturday night. Through the open door that led into the barn came the sound of moving horses, of feet stirring, of teeth champing on hay, of the rattle of halter chains. In the stable buck's room a small electric globe threw a meager yellow light. Crook sat on his bunk. His shirt was out of his jeans in back. In one hand he held a bottle of liniment, and with the other he rubbed his spine. Now and then he poured a few drops of the liniment into his pink-palmed hand and reached up under his shirt to rub again. He flexed his muscles against his back and shivered. Noiselessly Lenny appeared in the open doorway and stood there looking in, his big shoulders nearly filling the opening. For a moment Crooks did not see him, but on raising his eyes he stiffened and a scowl came on his face. His hand came out from under his shirt. Lenny smiled helplessly in an attempt to make friends. Crooks said sharply, you got no right to come in my room. This here's my room. Nobody got any right in here but me. Lenny gulped and his smile grew more fawning. I ain't doing nothing, he said. Just come to look at my puppy. And I seen your light, he explained. Well, I got a right to have a light. You go on get out of my room. I ain't wanted in the bunkhouse, and you ain't wanted in my room. Why ain't you wanted? Lenny asked. Cause I'm black. They play cards in there, but I can't play because I'm black. They say I stink. Well, I tell you, you all of you stink to me. Lenny flapped his big hands helplessly. Everybody went into town, he said. Slim and George and everybody. George says I gotta stay here and not get in no trouble. I seen your light. Well, what do you want? Nothing, I seen your light. I thought I could just come in and set. Crook stared at Lenny, and he reached behind him and took down the spectacles and adjusted them over his pink ears and stared again. I don't know what you're doing in the barn anyway, he complained. You ain't no skinner. They's no call for a bucker to come into the barn at all. You ain't no skinner. You ain't got nothing to do with the horses. The pup, Lenny repeated. I come to see my pup. Well, go see your pup, then. Don't come in a place where you're not wanted. Lenny lost his smile. He advanced a step into the room, then remembered and backed to the door again. I looked at M a little. Slim says I ain't to pet M very much. Crook said, well, you been talking M out of the nest all the time. I wonder the old lady don't move M someplace else. Oh, she don't care. She lets me. Lenny had moved into the room again. Crook scowled, but Lenny's disarming smile defeated him. Come on in and set a while, Crook said. Long as you won't get out and leave me alone, you might as well set down. His tone was a little more friendly. All the boys gone into town, huh? All but old candy. He just sets in the bunkhouse sharpening his pencil and sharpening and figuring. 
Crooks adjusted his glasses. Figuring? What's Candy figuring about? Lenny almost shouted, about the rabbits. You're nuts, said Crooks. You're crazy as a wedge. What rabbits you talking about? The rabbits we're gonna get, and I get to tend em, cut grass and give em water, and like that. Just nuts, said Crooks. I don't blame the guy you travel with for keeping you out of sight. Lenny said quietly, it ain't no lie. We're gonna do it. Gonna get a little place and live on the fat of the lawn, dot. Crook settled himself more comfortably on his bunk. Set down, he invited. Set down on the nail keg. Lenny hunched down on the little barrel. You think it's a lie, Lenny said. But it ain't no lie. Ever words the truth, and you can ast George. Crooks put his dark chin into his pink palm. You travel around with George, don't ya? Sure. Me and him goes ever place together. Crooks continued. Sometimes he talks, and you don't know what the hell he's talking about. Ain't that so? He leaned forward, boring Lenny with his deep eyes. Ain't that so? Yeah, sometimes. Just talks on, and you don't know what the hell it's all about? Yeah, sometimes. But, not always. Crooks leaned forward over the edge of the bunk. I ain't a southern negro, he said. I was born right here in California. My old man had a chicken ranch, about ten acres. The white kids come to play at our place, and sometimes I went to play with them, and some of them was pretty nice. My old man didn't like that. I never knew till long later why he didn't like that. But I know now. He hesitated, and when he spoke again his voice was softer. There wasn't another colored family for miles around. And now there ain't a colored man on this ranch and there's just one family in Soledad. He laughed. If I say something, why it's just a nigger saying it. Lenny asked, how long you think it'll be before them pups will be old enough to pet? Crooks laughed again. A guy can talk to you and be sure you won't go blabbing. Couple of weeks and them pups will be all right. George knows what he's about. Just talks, and you don't understand nothing. He leaned forward excitedly. This is just a nigger talkin', and a busted back nigger. So it don't mean nothing, see? You couldn't remember it anyways. I seen it over and over, a guy talkin', to another guy and it don't make no difference if he don't hear or understand. The thing is, they're talkin', or they're settin', still not talkin'. It don't make no difference, no difference. His excitement had increased until he pounded his knee with this hand. George can tell you screwy things, and it don't matter. It's just the talking. It's just being with another guy. That's all. He paused. His voice grew soft and persuasive. S'pose George don't come back no more. S'pose he took a powder and just ain't coming back. What'll you do then? Lenny's attention came gradually to what had been said. What? he demanded. I said espose George went into town tonight and you never heard of him no more. Crooks pressed forward some kind of private victory. Just espose that, he repeated. He won't do it, Lenny cried. George wouldn't do nothing like that. I been with George a long a time. He'll come back tonight dash, but the doubt was too much for him. Don't you think he will? Crook's face lighted with pleasure in his torture. Nobody can't tell what a guy'll do, he observed calmly. Lee say he wants to come back and can't. Suppose he gets killed or hurt so he can't come back. Lenny struggled to understand. George won't do nothing like that, he repeated. George is careful. He won't get hurt. He ain't never been hurt, cause he's careful. 
Well, espose, just espose he don't come back. What'll you do then? Lenny's face wrinkled with apprehension. I don't know. Say, what you doin' anyways, he cried. This ain't true. George ain't got hurt. Crooks bored in on him. Want me to tell you what'll happen? They'll take you to the booby hatch. They'll tie you up with a collar, like a dog. Suddenly Lenny's eyes centered and grew quiet, and mad. He stood up and walked dangerously toward Crooks. Who hurt George, he demanded. Crooks saw the danger as it approached him. He edged back on his bunk to get out of the way. I was just supposing, he said. George ain't hurt. He's all right. He'll be back all right. Lenny stood over him. What you supposin' for? Ain't nobody goin' to suppose no hurt to George. Crooks removed his glasses and wiped his eyes with his fingers. Just sat down, he said. George ain't hurt. Lenny growled back to his seat on the nail keg. Ain't nobody goin' to talk no hurt to George, he grumbled. Crooks said gently, maybe you can see now. You got George. You know he's going to come back. S'pose you didn't have nobody. S'pose you couldn't go into the bunkhouse and play rummy cause you was black. How'd you like that? S'pose you had to sit out here and read books. Sure you could play horseshoes till it got dark, but then you got to read books. Books ain't no good. A guy needs somebody to be near him. He whined, a guy goes nuts if he ain't got nobody. Don't make no difference who the guy is, long's he's with you. I tell ya, he cried, I tell ya a guy gets too lonely and he gets sick. George gonna come back, Lenny reassured himself in a frightened voice. Maybe George come back already. Maybe I better go see. Crook said, I didn't mean to scare you. He'll come back. I was talking about myself. A guy sets alone out here at night, maybe reading books or thinking or stuff like that. Sometimes he gets thinking, and he got nothing to tell him what's so and what ain't so. Maybe if he sees something, he don't know whether it's right or not. He can't turn to some other guy and AST him if he sees it too. He can't tell. He got nothing to measure by. I seen things out here. I wasn't drunk. I don't know if I was asleep. If some guy was with me, he could tell me I was asleep, and then it would be all right. But I just don't know. Crooks was looking across the room now, looking toward the window. Lenny said miserably, George won't go away and leave me. I know George won't do that. The stable buck went on dreamily, I remember when I was a little kid on my old man's chicken ranch. Had two brothers. They was always near me, always there. Used to sleep right in the same room, right in the same bed all three. Had a strawberry patch. Had an alfalfa patch. Used to turn the chickens out in the alfalfa on a sunny morning. My brothers sat on a fence rail and watch, em, white chickens they was. Gradually Lenny's interest came around to what was being said. George says we're gonna have alfalfa for the rabbits. What rabbits? We're gonna have rabbits and a berry patch. You're nuts. We are too. You A.S.T. George. You're nuts. Crooks was scornful. I seen hundreds of men come by on the road and on the ranches, with their bindles on their back and that same damn thing in their heads. Hundreds of them. They come, and they quit and go on, and every damn one of em's got a little piece of land in his head. And never a goddamn one of em ever gets it. Just like heaven. Everybody wants a little piece of lawn. I read plenty of books out here. Nobody never gets to heaven, and nobody gets no land. It's just in their head. They're all the time talking about it, 
but it's just in their head. He paused and looked toward the open door, for the horses were moving restlessly and the halter chains clinked. A horse whinnied. I guess somebody's out there, Crook said. Maybe Slim. Slim comes in sometimes too, three times a night. Slim's a real skinner. He looks out for his team. He pulled himself painfully upright and moved toward the door. That you, Slim, he called. Candy's voice answered. Slim went in town. Say, you seen Lenny? You mean the big guy? Yeah. Seen him around any place? He's in here, Crooks said shortly. He went back to his bunk and lay down. Candy stood in the doorway scratching his bald wrist and looking blindly into the lighted room. He made no attempt to enter. Tell you what, Lenny. I've been figuring out about them rabbits. Crook said irritably, you can come in if you want. Candy seemed embarrassed. I do, no. Course, if you want me to. Come on in. If everybody's coming in, you might just as well. It was difficult for Crooks to conceal his pleasure with anger. Candy came in, but he was still embarrassed, you got a nice cozy little place in here, he said to Crooks. Must be nice to have a room all to yourself this way. Sure, said Crooks. And a manure pile under the window. Sure, it's swell. Lenny broke in, you said about them rabbits. Candy leaned against the wall beside the broken collar while he scratched the wrist stump. I've been here a long time, he said. And Crook's been here a long time. This the first time I ever been in his room. Crook said darkly, guys don't come into a colored man's room very much. Nobody been here but Slim. Slim and the boss. Candy quickly changed the subject. Slim's as good a skinner as I ever seen. Lenny leaned toward the old swamper. About them rabbits, he insisted. Candy smiled. I got it figured out. We can make some money on them rabbits if we go about it right. But I get to tend them, Lenny broke in. George says I get to tend them. He promised. Crooks interrupted brutally. You guys is just kiddin' yourself. You'll talk about it a hell of a lot, but you won't get no land. You'll be a swamper here till they take you out in a box. Hell, I seen too many guys. Lenny here'll quit and be on the road in two, three weeks. Seems like ever guy got land in his head. Candy rubbed his cheek angrily. You goddamn right we're gonna do it. George says we are. We got the money right now. Yeah, said Crooks. And where's George now? In town in a whore house. That's where your money's going. Jesus, I seen it happen too many times. I seen too many guys with land in their head. They never get none under their hand. Candy cried, sure they all want it. Everybody wants a little bit of land, not much. Just something that was his. Something he could live on and there couldn't nobody throw him off of it. I never had none. I planted crops for damn near everybody in this state, but they wasn't my crops, and when I harvested them, it wasn't none of my harvest. But we gonna do it now, and don't you make no mistake about that. George ain't got the money in town. That money's in the bank. Me and Lenny and George. We gonna have a room to ourselves. We're gonna have a dog and rabbits and chickens. We're gonna have green corn and maybe a cow or a goat. He stopped, overwhelmed with his picture. Crooks asked, you say you got the money? Damn right. We got most of it. Just a little bit more to get. Have it all in one month. George got the land all picked out, too. Crooks reached around and explored his spine with his hand. I never seen a guy really do it, he said. 
I seen guys nearly crazy with loneliness for land, but ever, time a whorehouse or a blackjack game took what it takes. He hesitated. If you, guys would want a hand to work for nothing, just as keep, why I'd come and lend a hand. I ain't so crippled I can't work like a son of a bitch if I want to. Any you boys seen Curly? They swung their heads toward the door. Looking in was Curly's wife. Her face was heavily made up. Her lips were slightly parted. She breathed strongly, as though she had been running. Curly ain't been here, Candy said sourly. She stood still in the doorway, smiling a little at them, rubbing the nails of one hand with the thumb and forefinger of the other. And her eyes traveled from one face to another. They left all the weak ones here, she said finally. Think I don't know where they all went? Even Curly. I know where they all went. Lenny watched her, fascinated, but Candy and Crooks were scowling down away from her eyes. Candy said, then if you know, why you want to AST us where Curly is at? She regarded them amusedly. Funny thing, she said. If I catch any one man, and he's alone, I get along fine with him. But just let two of the guys get together and you won't talk. Just nothing but mad. She dropped her fingers and put her hands on her hips. You're all scared of each other, that's what. Ever one of you scared the rest is going to get something on you. After a pause Crook said, maybe you better go along to your own house now. We don't want no trouble. Well, I ain't giving you no trouble. Think I don't like to talk to somebody ever, once in a while? Think I like to stick in that house all the time? Candy laid the stump of his wrist on his knee and rubbed it gently with his hand. He said accusingly, you got a husband. You got no call foolin' around with other guys, causing trouble. The girl flared up. Sure I got a husband. You all seen him. Swell guy, ain't he? Spends all his time saying what he's gonna do to guys he don't like, and he don't like nobody. Think I'm gonna stay in that 2 by 4 house and listen how Curly's gonna lead with his left twice it, and then bring in the ol' right cross. 1-2, he says. Just the ol' 1-2 and he'll go down. She paused and her face lost its sullenness and grew interested. Say, what happened to Curly's Han? There was an embarrassed silence. Candy stole a look at Lenny. Then he coughed. Why? Curly. He got his Han caught in a machine, ma'am. Bust his Han, dot. She watched for a moment, and then she laughed. Baloney. What you think you're selling to me? Curly started some pin, he didn't finish. Caught in a machine, baloney. Why, he ain't give nobody the good ol' one too since he got his Han bust. Who bust him? Candy repeated sullenly, got it caught in a machine. A right, she said contemptuously. A right, cover him up if you wanta. Wada I care? You bindle bums think you're so damn good. Why do you think I am, a kid? I tell ya I could have went with shows. Not just one, neither. And a guy told me he could put me in pictures. She was breathless with indignation. Satiddy night. Everybody out doin, sompin. Everybody. And what am I doin? Standin' here talkin' to a bunch of bindle stiffs a nigger and a dum-dum and a lousy ol' sheep and leakin' it because they ain't nobody else. Lenny watched her, his mouth half open. Crooks had retired into the terrible protective dignity of the negro. But a change came over old Candy. He stood up suddenly and knocked his nail keg over backward. I had enough, he said angrily. You ain't wanted here. We told you you ain't. And I tell ya, you got floozy idars about what us guys amounts to. You ain't got sense enough in that chicken head to even see that we ain't stiffs. 
S'pose you get us canned. S'pose you do. You think we'll hit the highway and look for another lousy two-bit job like this. You don't know that we got our own ranch to go to, and our own house. We ain't got to stay here. We got a house and chickens and fruit trees and a place a hundred time prettier than this. And we got friends, that's what we got. Maybe there was a time when we was scared of getting canned, but we ain't no more. We got our own lawn, and it's ours, and we see and go to it. Curly's wife laughed at him. Baloney, she said. I seen too many you guys. If you had two bits in the world, why you'd be in getting two shots of corn with it and suckin' the bottom of the glass. I know you guys. Candy's face had grown redder and redder, but before she was done speaking, he had control of himself. He was the master of the situation. I might have knew, he said gently. Maybe you just better go along and roll your hoop. We ain't got nothing to say to you at all. We know what we got, and we don't care whether you know it or not. So maybe you better just scatter along now, cause Curly maybe ain't gonna like his wife out in the barn with us, Bindle stiffs. She looked from one face to another, and they were all closed against her. And she looked longest at Lenny, until he dropped his eyes in embarrassment. Suddenly she said, where'd you get them bruises on your face? Lenny looked up guiltily. Who me? Yeah, you. Lenny looked to Candy for help, and then he looked at his lap again. He got his Han caught in a machine, he said. Curly's wife laughed. Okay, machine. I'll talk to you later. I like machines. Candy broke in. You let this guy alone. Don't you do no messing around with him. I'm gonna tell George what you says. George won't have you messin' with Lenny. Who's George? she asked. The little guy you come with? Lenny smiled happily. That's him, he said. That's the guy, and he's gonna let me tend the rabbits. Well, if that's all you want, I might get a couple rabbits myself. Crook stood up from his bunk and faced her. I had enough, he said coldly. You got no rights comin' in a colored man's room. You got no rights messing around in here at all. Now you just get out, and get out quick. If you don't, I'm gonna AST the boss not to ever let you come in the barn no more. She turned on him in scorn. Listen, nigger, she said. You know what I can do to you if you open your trap? Crook stared hopelessly at her, and then he sat down on his bunk and drew into himself. She closed on him. You know what I could do? Crook seemed to grow smaller, and he pressed himself against the wall. Yes, ma'am. Well, you keep your place then, nigger. I could get you strung up on a tree so easy it ain't even funny. Crooks had reduced himself to nothing. There was no personality, no ego, nothing to arouse either like or dislike. He said, yes, ma'am, and his voice was toneless. For a moment she stood over him as though waiting for him to move so that she could whip at him again, but Crook sat perfectly still, his eyes averted, everything that might be hurt drawn in. She turned at last to the other two. Old Candy was watching her, fascinated. If you was to do that, we'd tell, he said quietly. We'd tell about you framin' Crooks. Tell and be damned, she cried. Nobody'd listen to you, and you know it. Nobody'd listen to you. Candy subsided. No. He agreed. Nobody'd listen to us. Lenny whined, I wish George was here. I wish George was here. Candy stepped over to him. Don't you worry none, he said. I just heard the guys comin' in. George'll be in the bunkhouse right now, I bet. He turned to Curly's wife. You better go home now, he said quietly. If you go right now, we won't tell Curly you was here. She appraised him coolly. I ain't sure you heard nothing. 
Better not take no chances, he said. If you ain't sure, you better take the safe way. She turned to Lenny. I'm glad you bust up Curly a little bit. He got it coming, to him. Sometimes I'd like to bust him myself. She slipped out the door and disappeared into the dark barn. And while she went through the barn, the halter chains rattled, and some horses snorted and some stamped their feet. Crook seemed to come slowly out of the layers of protection he had put on. Was that the truth what you said about the guys come back? he asked. Sure. I heard M. Well, I didn't hear nothing. The gate banged, Candy said, and he went on, Jesus Christ, Curly's wife can move quiet. I guess she had a lot of practice, though. Crooks avoided the whole subject now. Maybe you guys better go, he said. I ain't sure I want you in here no more. A colored man got to have some rights even if he don't like them. Candy said, that bitch didn't ought to have said that to you. It wasn't nothing, Crook said dully. You guys comin', in and, set tin made me forget. What she says is true. The horses snorted out in the barn and the chains rang and a voice called, Lenny. Oh, Lenny. You in the barn? It's George, Lenny cried. And he answered, here, George. I'm right in here. In a second George stood framed in the door, and he looked disapprovingly about. What you doin', in Crook's room? You hadn't ought to be here. Crooks nodded. I told them, but they come in anyways. Well, wayn't you kick em out? I deant care much, said Crooks. Lenny's a nice fella. Now Candy aroused himself. Oh, George. I been figurin' and figurin'. I got it doped out how we can even make some money on them rabbits. George scowled. I thought I told you not to tell nobody about that. Candy was crestfallen. Didn't tell nobody but crooks. George said, well you guys get out of here. Jesus, seems like I can't go away for a minute. Candy and Lenny stood up and went toward the door. Crooks called, Candy. Huh. Remember what I said about Hoen and doing odd jobs? Yeah, said Candy. I remember. Well, just forget it, said Crooks. I didn't mean it. Just foolin'. I wouldn't want to go no place like that. Well, okay, if you feel like that. Good night. The three men went out of the door. As they went through the barn the horses snorted and the halter chains rattled. Crook sat on his bunk and looked at the door for a moment, and then he reached for the liniment bottle. He pulled out his shirt in back, poured a little liniment in his pink palm and, reaching around, he fell slowly to rubbing his back.